If you've ever seen any of my overview videos, you might have noticed that I tend to mention something like this a lot. Long term, consider buying Sega's iMe card, consider buying into the e-amusement service. They have this card that you can buy to get. And after talking about it so much, I thought it'd be an interesting idea to talk about these cards for an entire video, going a bit more in-depth into how they work and what makes them pretty interesting. I mean, how did we get from simple little rhythm games that were just about stepping arrows to assert dominance at your local arcade scene, to an online system that connects you to the rest of the world, suddenly coming to the realization that some guy named Dongmin from Thailand could easily destroy you. Unless you're, I don't know, Chris Chike or something. But before we get into the specifics of each card, we should probably ask, what do they even do? Because I'd rather not have to repeat myself describing each card. With that said, there are several common elements that are pretty much universal among all the cards, and they mainly serve to do these few things. Save player data such as scores and unlocks, give access to secret songs and special events, and allow for cosmetic options to give your profile a unique flair. As for how we got to this point, well, you can blame Konami in 2003 when they implemented the EME system into their arcade games. For a small monthly fee paid by the arcade, it added a way for Konami to update their games without having to send update discs to arcade operators by simply connecting the machines to the servers. Though at this point, eAmusement was strictly Japan exclusive, with Guitar Freak's 8th mix and Drum Mania's 7th mix being the first game to be compatible with the system. Compared to the present day, it was pretty primitive, it could only track high scores and submit internet rankings. If players wanted to use the system, they would have to pay a small fee to buy something called an entry card. You would usually buy these at the arcade's front desk or at a special vending machine, and these cards would have special designs specific to a certain game, so you didn't have to go through your wallet trying to figure out which card is used for which game. It was a magnetic striped card, which is the type of technology that you would find in stuff like credit cards, and you could only use one for each game, meaning that if you wanted to create a profile for 2DX and DDR, you would have had to buy two separate cards. Obviously, this can get relatively expensive if you're playing multiple Bimani games, not to mention totally inconvenient as you'd be carrying multiple cards when you didn't really need to. Thankfully, that only lasted for about three years, as Konami launched the second and current iteration of the e-amusement system in 2006 through the release of DDR Supernova, which despite the game's worldwide release, the e-amusement service stayed in Japan. However, this time instead of using the entry card system, Konami replaced it with the e-amusement pass that we know and love today. Instead of the magnetic stripe, it was a contactless RFID smart card that worked with all the games that were compatible with the new system. Granted, you still need to pay 5 bucks to get the card, but at least you didn't have to buy multiple cards for different but money games as all the data was stored on one card. Which I mean, wow, Konami providing something that actually improved the customer's user experience? Mind blown! But going back to Supernova, the service was a bit more fleshed out, as it came with all the features that we've come to expect in our rhythm games. From the rival system to unlockable content, it was the start of something new. But gosh darn it, we still wouldn't get e-amusement in the US. That was until... DDR Ace was released in North America on July 6, 2016, and was the first game to ever support e-amusement outside of Asia, so now all the Westerners could join in on the fun by going to their local Dave & Busters on half-off Wednesdays to grind on the newest events that Konami would put out periodically. And as a rhythm gamer myself, I knew I had to buy one of these cards. To be honest, they're pretty cool, and they've had different designs over the years. Although I personally didn't like the first two designs because they kind of looked tacky and they didn't really age well in my opinion, however, I really really liked their third and fourth designs. It was simple, clean, and it had a very modern and minimalist look to it. In addition to the default design, there are also special edition cards that you could pretty much only get in Japan, or if you feel like destroying your wallet, import through Saitek Yahoo Auction. Now, do they serve any special purpose? No, but they do look pretty cool as part of a collection, so there's that. Though of course Konami is only one of the many different companies that offer this type of service, as Sega released their own service called iMe in 2010, which covers their Perform My series of rhythm games Hatsune Miku Project Diva and Waka for some reason. Generally, you can only get these cards in Asia, yet interestingly enough, the iMe service is accessible in the US, considering that I was able to make an iMe account through Waka. As for the Perform My games, well, haha. <laughs> 
Good luck trying to find them in the US, much less a machine that's connected to Sega's online servers, while Project Diva on the other hand has online functionality. Aimee essentially has the same features as the e-amusement pass, however what makes this card stand out from all the rest is just how much value you're gonna get out of buying this card. If you ever find yourself in Japan, they're only around 300 yen, and it's actually worth shelling out the money for, since the first game is free, and considering how each game is 100 yen, and the free game perk applies to every game that uses Aimee, you'll end up getting more than what you paid for. However, if you live in America, it'll probably be a bit more expensive, considering profit margins and all that, but even then, it'll cost you at most 5 or 6 bucks, and you'll probably get a card that is not Aimee for reasons I'll explain later. And again, if you want to splurge, there are also the special edition Aimee cards that they give out during events, ranging from Ongeki cards to designs based off Sega's other arcade games such as Fate Grand Order and Kantai Collection. With that said, that's pretty much it regarding Sega's Aimee service. Next up, we have the last of what I'd call the Big Three, which is Bandai Namco and their Bana Passport, which is primarily used for Taiko no Tatsujin, and that's about it on the rhythm game front. Sure, you could use it with their other games like Wangan Midnight or that JoJo Battle Royale, but they're not rhythm games, so it's kind of irrelevant. As far as functionality is concerned, it's the bare bones package, nothing that makes it really stand out. It doesn't support a big repertoire of rhythm games like Konami, nor does it bring the sort of value that Sega offers. Add on to the fact that Taiko being really hard to find in the US, it's kind of a hard sell to the uninitiated. Personally, I'd still buy it to complete the collection, but you could afford to hold back buying this card, considering that it uses the same online infrastructure as Aimee, making Taiko compatible with their cards. Then we have Taito, who revealed their Nesica Cross Live service in 2010 at the Japan Amusement Expo, and was first used for the Arc System Works game Blaze Blue Continuum Shift 2. The system was initially put in place to give arcade operators an easier time getting new fighting games, by allowing them to download games onto their arcade machines as opposed to buying new hardware allowing arcades to switch games on the fly based on consumer demand. It supports a large number of titles, predominantly fighting games, but has gone on to expand its support to the rhythm games Groove Coaster and the Japan exclusive, get this, Love Live School Idol Festival After School Activity Next Stage. Unlike the Aimee card, you can pretty much find them at a round one near you, and it has that first game perk for Groove Coaster. The card generally goes for 6 bucks, but hey, it's kind of worth it if you're planning to get into the game. Last but not least is the AM Pass by the South Korean company Andrew Mira which was designed to be used for the Pump It Up series starting with Prime 2. And I don't know what they did to the Pump It Up card, but why the frick is it $12? It's not as if they were giving you free games or anything, no special offer that justifies that markup, not to mention that you have to go to their website and create an account before you can actually use it, whereas with the other games you could just create the account in-game. Criticism aside, the AM Pass probably offers one of the more unique experiences of them all. Aside from all the standard stuff, there's online matching, which allows you to play online with players all over the world, along with what is called User Custom Steps, or UCS for short. This mode allows for users to download custom charts through the Pump It Up website onto their card, and play them whenever they scan their card on the reader. Sadly, it's not like Osu, where you could just chart any song, which is understandable, but still, that kinda sucks. With that said, if you're really, really into DDR booth, Korean boy bands, just know that you'll be paying quite a premium to save your scores and buy charts with PP. Then again, who knows, as there have been recent announcements about a new rhythm game called Chrono Circle which also uses the AM Pass and while there's little information to go off of right now, there's room to speculate as to what unique features it might unlock for the game and how it might increase the card's utility going forward. And as arcade games evolve even further, it's really interesting to see how this part of the industry can really change things in the long run. Case in point, the Amusement IC system, an effort by Konami, Sega, Bandai, and most recently Taito to centralize all of their services into one system, effectively making their cards cross-compatible with each other, further eliminating the need to buy multiple cards, and at the same time, establish a form of collaboration between the otherwise rival companies. This has very apparent benefits, seeing as it's cheaper and more convenient to the consumer, and while this is a great thing as more games become compatible with the system, I can't help but feel a little bittersweet as each card had its own unique design and purpose. With Amusement IC becoming the dominant system, you run out of good excuses to collect the cards from all the different companies, as it's just better to buy one card and stick with it. Other than that, there's also Osaifu Keitai, which is a Japan-only service that allows users to use their smartphone in place of plastic cards, with eAmusement being compatible with the service since 2010 and most of the major companies following suit. If this sounds familiar to you, it should, because it's essentially Google Pay before Google Pay. 
In addition, both Konami and Sega have been developing their own form of digital currency in the form of Paselli and Aimee Pay, respectively, both acting as a medium to store money, much like a debit card. Though if you ask me, I kinda wanna see an alternate timeline where Paselli becomes the dominant cryptocurrency, cause why not? We got freaking Dogecoin, now imagine an arcade-based cryptocurrency worth more than the US dollar. Needless to say, Japan and to a lesser extent Korea have somehow found a way to enhance the arcade experience with these cards. To me, it's always so exciting to get a new card, and it just feels so satisfying to use for the first time. It's kind of like a rite of passage for rhythm gamers. Gone are the pleb days where you're simply referred to as guest to someone who's pretty much committed themselves to the game. At first glance, you'd think that these concepts would be diametrically opposed to each other, as arcades are meant to be places where you hang out every once in a while, whereas creating a profile would imply that you'd be putting down a 20 to play rhythm games regularly. But then again, that's kind of the genius of it, as it gives you an incentive to go back, and in return, it gives you a sort of personal experience on a machine that is designed to be communal in nature. In any case, these cards are great, and I can't wait to see how they can be used to push the boundaries of rhythm games and arcades in general. Just thinking about it makes me wish that other arcades would start taking notes, but that's a topic for another day. And before I end, I would like to take this chance to thank all of you guys for making this channel reach 1,000 subscribers. If it weren't for you guys just watching, liking, subscribing, even promoting the videos, I wouldn't get to where I am today in a little over a year no less. And for that, I am truly grateful to all of you. This is the Friendly Neighborhood Reboot, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.